Soto's a pendejo. It's funny, we, Jack and I were just talking about Soto before we came over here. He's a number one guy. Um, I, I feel as though I ought to sing after that wonderful exhibit we saw, except that that's the one thing I can't do uh, publicly. There's a lot of things I can't do. Um, I once talked to Merle Haggard, uh, and we were wondering, I said, why didn't you become a writer? You've, you've got such, obviously, such a gift for language. He said, because I can sing. And I said, now you know why I don't sing. Uh, the son of a friend of mine has a small uh, import, export business in Berkeley, and uh, he's very slowly moving into the valley, going uh, over to Stockton and then down to Modesto. And when he came back from his first trip to Bakersfield, his father called me and said, listen, you can't believe what Jeff said. I said, what's that? He said, well, he went to Bakersfield, and he said, you know, Pop, people are different down there. They're wall-eyed, they're snaggle-toothed, but Pop, they look right at you. They're real. So I went to the mirror, and uh, there's a little bit left, but uh, it's, not, it's, it's not entirely gone yet. <laughs> um, to some dwellers in coastal California, the valley is a, is a big mystery, and it has been a mystery. Uh, the, the, it doesn't fit the, the model that they've got in their minds of what's supposed to be California. And so it, it, it makes it possible for someone like me to, to write about an area that is so rich and so interesting with very little competition until this generation came along. And all these fine young writers began writing, people like Manuel Munoz, for example, or Frank Bergeon. Uh, but it's good to be at least part of that, of that process. Way back in the late 60s, uh, I, said, I remember sending a manuscript off. It, it had gotten an honorable mention in some manuscript competition. And I was still teaching myself how to write. I was very much a beginner. And I sent it to a New York publisher. Then I sat back and, and awaited the contract that would surely come in the mail. And I awaited, and I awaited some more. And pretty soon, a letter came, and it actually had some writing on it, some part of which, and I'm only paraphrasing this, uh, said, you should find a more interesting area to write about. <laughs> no one will be interested in the goings-on of a remote California valley. And I thought, boy, howdy. Uh, a remote California valley. Her parochialism stunned me. Here's a, a big time, supposedly a big time New York editor. If this is a remote valley, then the Grand Canyon's a small ravine in Arizona. Uh, <laughs> So I, I was you know, inflamed, and I went around the house, and Jan, my wife, I'm sure, got tired of me saying, it's as big as Egypt. It's as, it's as big as England. It's the richest agricultural region in the history of the world. It's America's leading producer of petroleum. Uh, it gave us the, the Brown versus Board of Education decision, thanks to Earl Warren, and, and on and on and on. You know, every little thing I could think of, I was snorting and and pooping around, and uh, finally Jan says, don't tell me, write it. And uh, it seemed like a pretty good idea. But what actually happened about then was that a, 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 another friend, who was actually a brand new friend at the time, and I got together, this was Jim Houston, James D. Houston, the novelist, wonderful writer, wonderful person. Uh, and it turns out Jim had been for a long time interested in life in the Central Valley. And, uh, and the two of us said, you know, why can't we do an anthology? Why can't, we couldn't find anything that looked like uh, a book of, from and about the valley. Why can't we do it? What's the point of waiting? And, uh, and so we did. We got started. We called some people, uh, including some high-powered people who you wouldn't think would answer the phone, like Kerry McWilliams, and talked to them and got their opinions. And, uh, and then we just began assembling material. Um, and we started with William Henry Brewer, uh, up and down California, 1860-1864. He said, the great interior valley of the state, often 30 or 40 miles wide, a perfect 
plain enclosed by high mountains on both sides. Its only opening is the Straits of Carquinas, and that's less than a mile wide. 450 miles on a nearly straight line. And Jim said, and I remember this conversation explicitly, neither one of us had grasped the dimension of this place where I was born. My, my great grandparents came from Mexico in the 1850s, uh, one set of great grandparents, uh, into the area around Fort Tejon, and then dropped down into what's ba now Bakersfield. I had no idea it was that, that size. We'd, I had cousins in Woodland, so our, my valley was Oildale to Woodland and back. Uh, and I think the dimension of it just, it, 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 it had not hit me. Uh, and I also uh, began to learn that the, the, the valley had, was beginning to produce, or had produced, unknowns to me, uh, some pretty fine art. Brewer, by the way, had said that, that uh, if the next generation here will care for Shakespeare, I'll be surprised. Or any other author growing up far from school. Well, Jim and I were looking around and already, you know, looking at work done in the 1960s, uh, we could see Leonard Gardner's wonderful novel, tough novel, Fat City. Uh, Shirley Ann Williams' remarkable poem, The Iconology of Childhood. Richard Doakey's very gritty story called Sanchez. And there, all of them showed a little of the dark side of life here, which I think is necessary if we're going to see the real side of life here. And so it was already being done. It was just that no one seemed to know about it. It wasn't, it wasn't reaching a large audience. And we were hoping that the anthology that we were going to do would then bring people like Sanchez, uh, people like Doki and Gardner and Williams to the same attention that someone like William Soroyan had earlier received. Of with his more whimsical, but you know, quite quite well done work, but more whimsical work, and so we just determined we would we would find a way to put this. We didn't have any money, by the way. This, that's another one of the little side lights. But we would put this anthology together. We would put something together about the remote valley. Um, I was always stunned by how little anybody knew, including me, about the valley. And by the fact that in the schools that I went to in Oildale and in Bakersfield, we never studied the valley. Uh, if they were talking about uh, 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 nature, we didn't talk about the nature of the valley. We, we talked in abstract terms. Uh, we didn't talk about the population of the valley. They might talk a little bit about the, the Mission Pass, but the Mission Pass they talked about had nothing to do with Bakersfield. Uh, there, there was one little tiny remote attempt at a mission and the Indians ran the Padres off in a hurry. Uh, and so it didn't have much to do with me. I, I wanted to find out about how agribusiness had developed. Uh, I wanted to find out wh where all of these people from so many different cultures had come from and, and what the impact of that was. And uh, there, was, there was, I mean, I couldn't see why you couldn't teach geography and zoology, uh, for example, just using valley topics. Starting with the valley and moving out to the world instead of starting with the abstract and maybe, maybe, mentioning the valley. So that was kind of an attitude that I at least brought to the, to the uh, project. Um, and so we decided that, as I said, we would put together a literary anthology. And when I mentioned this to one of my colleagues at Sonoma State, he chuckled and said, well, that'll be the thinnest book in the library. <laughs> well, it wasn't, as it turned out. Um, it was for Jim and me uh, what Henry Miller called a voyage of discovery. Along the way, we were told by various people various stories. I remember Leo Lee of Western Public Radio, for example, told me that he had asked some young farm workers uh, what their dreams were. And he'd ask, and he'd ask, and he realized he didn't have any dreams in the sense in which he was talking. They, they would say, oh, I dream about women. I dream about getting some grass. But they didn't have any aspirations. And that seemed to us to be a tragedy. It, it, it seems to us that one of the functions of literature and one of the functions of art uh, at any point uh, is to help cultivate the, the imagination and help cultivate the aspiration, to let people know, the, to have a sense of the possible. Uh, and so with that uh, as one of the backgrounds, we, we went ahead and, and embarked on this project. Uh, we called, decided to call the book California Heartland, Writing from the Great Central Valley. 
and it was to be the first, but not by no means the last or best uh, anthology from this valley. But it started for Jim and me that one, one afternoon when he showed me a diary entry by Juan Crespi from 1772. And it described what he, Crespi, saw from the shoulder of Mount Diablo looking east. He said, we descended a pass to its highest point. We ascended a pass to its highest point in order to make observations. And we saw that the land opened into a great plain as level as the palm of the hand, the valley, all level land, as far as the eye could see. Now, if you've been to Spain, you know there aren't any valleys like this in Spain. Uh, it must have come, uh, have been stunning, because he was seeing the whole valley that I could not yet imagine, even though I was raised here. Be, uh, he was coming to it with no presuppositions, or, or a few at least, presuppositions. So we as began assembling that material, uh, and we began to find first what we thought of as classic depictions, and we tried to balance it so that it was not uh, overcompensatory. I mean, the temptation is to say, you dirty rats in L.A., here, look at here, look how pretty Bakersfield is. The garden spot of America. I mean, we didn't say that. We realized it was nonsense. We wanted to give a, a, a balanced view. And so we would take something like John Muir's The Bee Pastures, written about this very area. Uh, and he said, it be, uh, the great central plain of California during the months of March, April, and May was one smooth, continuous bed of honey bloom so marvelously rich that in walking from one end to the other, a distance of more than 400 miles, our foot would press about 100 flowers with every step. But apparently he didn't see it when Brewer saw it, because William Henry Brewer, seeing it in the fall, described it, and I quote, as a plain of absolute desolation. How do we deal with that? We just included them both. Two different sections of the valley, two different times of the year. Uh, and, that, and we began to try to build a, a realistic picture of, of what was going on. Um, the valley wasn't considered an easy place to live in the old days, and that was confirmed by a 19th century folk song entitled The Plains of the San Joaquin. Don't go, I say, if you've got any brains. You'll stay far away from the San Joaquin Plains. At four in the morning, they're hustling up tools, feed curry and harness 10 long-eared old mules, plow 24 miles through the sunshine and rain, or your blanket you'll roll on the San Joaquin Plain. Well, having been raised uh, as a farm worker, uh, I understood exactly what they were talking about. Uh, and there was one other thing we saw in looking at the early material that came as a shock to me, I must admit, and, and it explained a great deal. And that was very simply the beginnings of a multi-ethnic or multicultural society right from the start. 1863 at Fort Miller, what we today call Millerton, quote, uh, and I, this is uh, William Henry Brewer, he said it was a truly Californian mixture of races there. The landlord a Scotsman, a Chinese cook, a Negro waiter, and an Indian stable boy. He didn't add it was also the typical social order, white on top. But we didn't, you don't need that to be preached to you. We've, we've all seen that sort of thing. And indeed, if you look at the history of farm labor in the valley, and Jim and I did do that, you start seeing wave after wave. The Chinese come in, uh, and they're followed by Japanese. They're followed by Latinos. They're followed by Filipinos. And on and on uh, through the Dust Bowl migrants, uh, many of which, whom were not white, by the way, that's one of the fallacies of the, dust, uh, the way the Dust Bowl was studied by a lot of people. Um, a lot of people, it mixed Indian, black and Indian, black and white, Indian and white, and so on, came in in that migration. So uh, the rich history, so by the time the Hmong arrive, uh, by the time the Lebanese arrive, there's already a tradition of multiculture. And it struck, it's always struck me as being one of the great gifts of those of us raised in the valley is that we can rub elbows with so many different kinds of people. Uh, and I believe that in my
Though our city folks scorn it, cursing heat in the summer and drabness in winter, and flee it, Yosemite and the sea. They seek splendor, who would touch them must stun them. The nerve that is dying needs thunder to rouse it. I, in the vineyard, in green time and dead time, come to it dearly, and take nature neither freaked nor amazing, but at the secret shining, the soft indeterminate wonder, I watch it morning and noon, the unutterable sundowns, and love as the leaf does the bough. It, it, the poem really grap, grasped me uh, because I realized that you, things don't have to be necessarily beautiful to be beautiful. Uh, the beauty exists in your relationship with them. And that he, for my perspective at least, he had captured that. Perhaps taking their cues from Everson and Saroyan, many young writers at that time seemed to be seeking a place, seeing the place with fresh eyes, which, and I thought it needed that. Uh, every, every place, whether it's Merced or Bakersfield or Paris or Rome, needs to be seen with fresh eyes over and over and over again. It's never what it was. It's always what it is and what it's going to be. And we thought that needed to be pointed out uh, in the valley here. And the best example we found of that was a book called Down at the Santa Fe Depot in 1970, a collection of poetry from Fresno State. Uh, I, had, can't, I must honestly say I never thought of Fresno State as a great literary center at that point. Uh, and I was stunned by what I read, that, that the level was so high and that there was so much variety, such a richness of expression. Um, so I wrote to Philip Levine, the doyen of poetry at Fresno State, and asked if we could use some of his poetry. And he wrote back and said no. <laughs> We, he didn't like the non-Fresno State writers that Jim and I had intended to include. And I could see that there was some bargaining available there, but he forgot, he didn't seem to understand I'm also from the Valley, and so I said to hell with him and never wrote back. So, so the doyen of Fresno State is not in the anthology, uh, but Larry Levis. using his poetry, and he was not, also not interested. Um, he's gone on to become a, a genuinely major poet, or he's, he's viewed as a major poet in America today. And don't let him fool you, he's a farm boy from Bakersfield. My uncle was a foreman on his father's ranch. So we, were at the, we were one peg down socially from the Bedarts. Um, I, we also thought it was important to include work that did not extol the valley, that, that, that didn't just praise the valley. A lot of the poets are critical, of course. And, but I've always loved this passage from Joan Didion um, because it opens up other possibilities. Sacramento is California, and California is a place in which a boom mentality and a sense of Chekhovian loss meet in uneasy suspension in which the mind is troubled by some buried but ineradicable suspicion that things had better work here, because here, beneath that immense bleached sky, is where we run out of continent. Except, those powerful words, but except that the ancestors of Alan Chong Lao and Lawson Inada, whose families found California as a dramatic eastern opening to the American continent, didn't feel that way. Neither did the ancestors of Luis Valdez, or Luis Omar Salinas, or Gary Soto. They found a great northern gateway to opportunities. Uh, and so we just presented 
as many sides as we could of that of that discussion to let I wanted uh, we wanted folks to know that being rich and white was not necessarily the norm. And of course, Didion's words meant nothing at all to the Miwok or the Wintun, the Yokuts or the Maidu, uh, which was one of the richest populations of native cultures in all of the United States. It was right here in this valley. Uh, they didn't need Joe to tell them about an eastern opening or a western opening or any kind of an opening. What they really wanted was to be left alone. But perhaps Saroyan spoke for pale faces when he wrote of the Fresno area. We had come to this dry area that was without history, and we had paused in it and built our houses, and we were slowly creating the legend of our life. And of course, they were at that time creating a new history by pretending an old one didn't exist, and that's been part of our historical burden. A lot of folks might not remember now, unless they're as old as I am, that during the 1960s and 70s, the small press movement, the alternative press movement in America was, was thriving because of photo offset printing. And all of a sudden, there were writers coming at things from all different kinds of angles that were not acceptable to the New York publishing trade. Uh, and several of the artists, Jim and I included, w had large reputations in that smaller alternative publishing movement. I'm thinking of people like uh, Chico's George Keithley, uh, Stockton's Richard Doki, Sacramento's Gary Thompson, Riverdale's Art Coelho, Sacramento's Bill Hotchkiss. Uh, but we miss Maya Angelou, whose connection to Stockton was then unknown to us. We missed other top talents, such as Stockton's Maxine Hong Kingston, Hanford's Lee Nicholson, Fresno's Jane Jansen. In fact, it seems that most of the gifted writers we missed were women. And that's something for which we can only blame our ignorance. We learned in a hurry, but we, at the time, we were, we were just blank. We, we were looking in the wrong direction too narrowly. Blinders were there. And I was the guiltier of the two, by the way. Uh, ironically, the big discovery of the book, though, was a woman. Uh, Eddie Lopez, who was the book editor of the Fresno Bee, sent me copies of two self-published books by a maiden lady in Tulare. Wilma Elizabeth McDaniel. Now, I had never heard of Wilma Elizabeth McDaniel, but I've certainly known about 50 of her cousins. I was probably dating 30 of them. Uh, I should t let me just take a quick aside here. You saw Merle. You heard Merle talk on the, on the screen here a moment ago. It's going to be hard for you to believe it. Merle and I grew up with the same dialect. We lived a block apart. The, his world has become the southern world of country music, and mine has become the western world of academia. Neither one of us has a better dialect than the other, but his is a lot more interesting. Uh, I love I loved Wilma's work immediately, and so I, uh, I sent it to Jim. Uh, let me read you re really quickly the very first one we selected together. And you'll, m many of you will know this letter, uh, clothes dryer, excuse me. Monday used to be the day after Sunday. It meant wash day to most women on Persimmon Road, but seance to Ardella Pitts who always hung her dead husband up with wooden pins beside the yellow trousseau gown and allowed the wind to whip him with daffodil might while she washed his shirts and put away each week until a man in overalls who had no right broke Ardella's contract with the great beyond by installing a dryer. Now we never see Mr. Pitt and Ardella moans that he doesn't love her anymore. I had never read anything like that. I'd been taking college classes, you know, and these are not the kind of poems you get presented in college classes. And I was stunned. I just thought it was wonderful. She was, she was uh, not in any way uh, tied to literary convention. She was independent, downright feisty. Uh, so Jim and Eddie Lopez and I uh, all contacted her. And uh, when we had our first reading of the book a, a little later in 1978, I guess it was, uh, it was at Upstart Crow in Fresno. Uh, Wilma had never given a public reading before. At least that's what she told us. She was, she was a pretty clever gal. You never knew for sure. Um, and so when it came time for her to read, she, she wouldn't. She'd come all the way from Tulare, but she wouldn't read. So a folding chair was put on the stage, and I stood there and read her poems while she sat there and crossed her legs. 
getting, and the audience, of course, loved it. It was better than if she had been doing the reading herself. Um, that was the beginning of a, of a long series of friendships for, all, for, for, for Eddie, Jim, Wilma, and me. Uh, and uh, I, to this day, I think of her as the most original writer that, that we happened to encounter for that particular project. Uh, and when the book was published in 1978, it got pretty good reviews. And, uh, but I think Jim would agree with me that we missed far more good writers than we, than we published. It's just one of those things. You don't realize how serendipitous that is. The day after you turn in the manuscript for the last time, you see a poem by Gene Jansen that knocks your socks off. You say, oh, damn. Because uh, you can't pull it back. It's just too late. Um, my other favorite, personal favorite, in that collection was, an, was another, uh, this was a younger writer, a young man from the Bakersfield area named uh, Don Thompson, who, by the way, just has a new book out, I, I, I understand. But he was diff very different from Wilma in that Wilma wrote about characters very often. And there, were, there were little dramas, little stories very, very often. Uh, Don Thompson, uh, at that point in his career, at least, wrote about places, and he did it extremely well and with great economy. Here's uh, one on the Glenville Road. Oaks on the hillside like hobos in their ragged bark refused to move on. Stones slumped to the ground exhausted. No one knows how they made it so far. This is where creeks go dry and the wind runs out of breath. This is where you stop. Uh, I just thought he, that poem and the, and, and the po other poems he did were of a special uh, quality. They, 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 they left a lot of work for the reader, when, and I think that's a good thing. I think the more you uh, poets can involve readers in the creative process of your own poem, the deeper the relationship is with the poem, the reader, and the writer. And that's what I think uh, Don had accomplished in this regard. Uh, meanwhile, I have to say that while all this was going on, uh, Jim and I became deeper and deeper friends. Um, we both had Texas fathers, and we made a lot of fun out of that. And uh, we both loved country music, and we made a lot of fun out of that. And it got to the point where we, we began exchanging weekly phone calls, even if we didn't have anything to say. Certainly, we almost never had anything of consequence to say, but we occasionally had things to say. But the way the one who called would start every phone call was with a line from country music, and the other one would pick it up or not. And I can remember two in particular that I, I really liked. Um, hey, Oki, if you see Arky, tell him Texas got a job out in California picking up prunes, squeezing oil out of olives. That was one of my big favorites. And then Jim liked one of Merle's songs. Um, I don't have to wonder who she's had. No, it's not love, but it's not bad. And other you know, very high-level uh, literary work of that kind, and it it it, it, it turned into uh, to to a, you know, where I would just wait for these calls to come, usually on Wednesdays. Um, soon as the book was published, writers whom we didn't know anything about came out of the woodwork, as it were. They didn't know what we were doing. We didn't know what they were doing, and so we made it. And I'm thinking about people who went on and had some fairly significant reputations. People like Roberta Spear, Lee McCarthy, Ann Williams. Uh, Franz Weinschek, Mas Masamoto, Wendy Rose, Ernest Finney, Richard Rodriguez, I mean, and on, you could not, this list could go on and on. Uh, and we just, just determined that we would do everything we could to try to bring some attention to these writers. And so I began writing essays, like the ones I write for Boom Magazine, for example, it was up here earlier, that would, that would try to give, uh, bring more readers, more attention to people who could make their own decision whether they thought these writers were important or not. Uh, and then the antho other anthologies began to, uh, to, to, to appear. Valley Light by Jane Watts, At Rainbow's End and Proud Harvest by Art Coelho, uh, How Much Earth by Chris Buckley, uh, Peace Work by John Weinberg and Ernesto Trejo, Highway 99, the best, I think, of the anthologies from Central Valley, Highway 99 by Stan Yogi. Um, and uh, it was... Uh, Everyone would, would bring in new voices and new perspectives. And Jim and I, I remember talking once about the way in which our own perspective of the place that, in which that we could see, we could touch, it was a real physical place, but our perspective of its reality was changed by these writers 
who brought richer perspectives, different perspectives uh, than ours, and allowed us to expand a bit as we as we looked at things. And we would, you know, we were like proud fathers, Jim and I, when someone like Mark Arax or James Tyner, or uh, originally Shirley Ann Williams, uh, or just any of the uh, uh, the, the, the writers that, that followed came along, we began to feel as though we needed to help them take that next step if it was possible for us to do that. And of course it wasn't always possible, but we did our best to try to do that kind of thing. Uh, more recently, uh, I've been noticing a, 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 another, I guess today you could actually say renaissance. I think the first wave back in the 60s and 70s was the nations. And there's something like a renaissance going on now. And some of the writers that I admire, and, and, and they are just, this is a very small group, but uh, I think Manuel Munoz from Dainuba is a, a writer of real power. He, know, he knows the power of understatement. Uh, in his uh, uh, book, uh, What You See in the Dark, he, he describes a character this way. She was a waitress. She was a motel owner. She was a mother. She was an abandoned wife. She had a brother whom she loved at great, from a great distance, yet never saw again. Her name was Arlene. She served pie. And with this flat prose, he, he, he lays a life out for you. And you start realizing that lives have meaning as we give them meaning. It doesn't, it's not necessarily there. And he, he pulls that off very well. Frank Bergeon from Madeira, his novel, Jesse's Ghost, uh, is about the children of the Dust Bowl coming of age, literally battling each other and anyone else to establish a place in society. The tale is told by a blue collar white guy named Sonny. Sonny says, it's the, these are the opening lines of the book. The, the story of how I came to kill my best friend keeps pressing on my brain, but I can't remember it whole. That in the next 200 pages is the telling of that story. Uh, and it's, and it, the, it, it's straightforward, hard-nosed prose. Very few adjectives or adverbs. He, he really hits you hard. Um, and then there's a, you know, people like, as I mentioned earlier, Mark Arax, uh, Eris Janinigan, uh, Maria Matic. Uh, I just ran into a book called Land of Milk and Money, a novel about life on a Central Valley dairy by Anthony Barcelos. And I've just started it, so I can't tell you whether it's uh, good, great, or indifferent, but, uh, but it's certainly worth a, a read. And I, I noticed that a writer from Bakersfield just won the Flannery O'Connor Award for Best Short Fiction. Uh, her name is Melinda Mutsakis, and her book is uh, Bear Down, Bear North. Uh, I think of the young writers that I see, if, I, if we were doing another California Heartland today, I would, I would probably vote first for Tim Z. Hernandez. Uh, I think, uh, I don't know him, I've never met him, but I sure have met his books and uh, very much admire them. He writes with a, a dry, hard prose and he doesn't avoid subjects. He takes you right to the gut of problems. Um, he talks, for example, uh, Breathing in dust, he talks about a little town called Catella, which is a mythical town over in West and Fresno County. And he says it's residents uh, and their dreams. He said, in summer, a 68-day stretch of triple digits melts the air into wet ghosts that wiggle up from the hard pan and pavement and disappear on the horizon. And so do the hopes and dreams of most of the characters in the story, I might add. And yet, as, as grim as that sounds, it's utterly believable when you read it. Uh, it's, it's, it's wonderful, I think, to see these, this, this next generation coming up. Uh, the finest writers from the Valley have understood that you can't write writing. Uh, you've got to write life. You've got to write truth. It helps to develop what Emily Dickinson a long ago called a slant vision. Uh, so that instead of coming straight at things, you do it this way, and it's in the re the assembling of the reflection that the reader becomes deeply involved in the reality of, of which you write. Um, as I said, I, to me, what I always told my writing students, the most important challenge is to involve the reader in, as a co-creator in whatever you write. 
And if you do that, you will have someone who remembers what you said. Um, but I think I would like to close by, uh, by reading a poem from the poet whom I mentioned I missed, Jean Jansen, who was a, ni a nice Mennonite lady in Fresno, uh, and who just blew me away with her poetry. Uh, here's a poem called I Keep Forgetting. I Keep Forgetting. I keep forgetting, <clears throat> let's try it in English. I keep forgetting that flowers are sexual organs. All those years my mother reminded, reminded me to keep my legs together, my dress down. I bring in armfuls of these arranged bouquets and place them on our shining tables. And when I talk to you, the velvet petals lie open and breathe. And all night on the patio, jasmine so prim and tight unspirals itself to whatever flutters against it. She's a nasty lady. <laughs> and that's why I like her so well, I guess. Uh, I just thought, I've never been able to look at a flower the same way after reading that. And I think that's what I want a really good writer to do. I want him to shake my world up a little bit, give me a new set of eyes to use to look at the world. And I think Jean has done that. And I think many of the young writers who are, who are writing today are doing it. I, I always feel like I should apologize to the ones I don't mention because there are so many and uh, there's so many new and different ways to to approach all of this. But I think she is typical. She, Jean Jansen, is typical of the mature voices hereabouts. They have they have built a foundation for all the writers who are writing today. And uh, don't use them. Don't imi don't bother to imitate them except in your in your lessons. Uh, use them as springboards. Use them as trampolines. Uh, use them as diving boards, blown off of them and go way beyond them. Wilma would, would feel wonderful if she thought somebody had been able to use her writing to become a greater writer themselves and give a greater vision of what's going on. And I know that these other writers I've been talking about would too. Um, so let me speak for my late partner Jim and for myself and observe that I hope uh, readers haven't viewed this valley the same way after discovering writers like Jean and Wilma, like Tim and Manuel, that they will bring with it their own creativity and the creative interaction of person with place, and who knows, create their own masterpieces. Uh, because those artists, you artists, make me proud to be a native son. Thank you very much. <laughs>